Okay, so what is this video series all about? Um, what is it? I quite don't really know. Um, I want to go through this paper, Bounded Gaps Between Primes by Yiting Zhang, the guy who worked at Subway for a while before uh, he was recognized. Um, I've always wanted to read this paper, maybe this will promote me with some accountability of some sort, but um, I'm going to try to ideally post a video every day, probably around 30 minutes, maybe a little bit more depending on how I'm feeling, uh, just going through this paper and um, eventually hoping to understand it. I've only printed out the first 10 pages here, I'll print out more if I actually get that far. Um, give some idea of my background, uh, have a good understanding of undergraduate math, a little bit of graduate, so I'm up to basic algebra, like up to Galois theory, uh, differential topology, like I know what a vector bundle is, I know what like a manifold is, that's good enough. Uh, with regard to number theory, which is, like I know what a durational convolution is, uh, and all the basic like arithmetic congruence, all that from Maslow theorem, yeah. So, um, I would say like moderately accessible. Um, so, a bit, hopefully, like if you're a little bit less or a little bit more than I am, you'll still have some degree of like uh, you'll still derive some benefit from these videos. Uh, they're gonna be really informal. Not gonna edit this at all. Uh, it's mostly for my own benefit. If you find it useful, then cool. I expect like maybe three people to watch this. What's over? Um, so, with that said, let's just go ahead and start. Uh, bounded gaps between primes. The main result is uh, limit of pn plus 1 minus pn. So uh, essentially what this means is, uh, if it isn't already clear, that basically uh, the gaps between primes, so this is pn, and here's pn minus 1, uh, pn plus 1, sorry, uh, this gap. Uh, they're taking the limit, so what this means is it's like past some point, um, there's like a past any point that you pick, there's still infinitely many of these gaps, which are less than 70 million. And that's his main result. And why this is important is uh, this is the first result in this direction. Uh, so the twin prime conjecture would be that this is exactly equal to two, uh, because what that means is that like past any specific point, you would be able to find two primes that are exactly two apart. Um, and so the fact that you put a bound on this brings you a step closer. And I think basically right after this paper was published, the uh, Polymath Project, uh, led by Terence Tao, pushed this bound up to I think it was around two hundred forty-six, and I think now it's um, up to six. I'm not sure whether that's like conditional on something or unconditional. Um, but this, the groundbreaking work was laid by this, so this is what I want to understand. I don't know, this might take me three years, it might take me like two months, uh, it might take me like never, but uh, we'll see how this goes about. This is refinement of this work. I'm not sure if I should read this work first. Might be a good idea. Uh, small gaps between concept primes, blah blah blah. Uh, stronger version of this theorem. Free from large prime divisors only, but it's accurate for a purpose. I do remember actually watching a talk about uh, that he gave about this paper. Um, well, he outlines the main thing, and he said that like he was very, very loose with how all like all of his bounds and everything. He just wanted the stuff that would work to get this number finite, and so that's why this number is so huge. And he's, I think this is a reflection of that. Uh, contents. This is a 54-page paper, um, so I have only printed the first 10 pages. Uh, but let's start with the introduction. It's probably a good place. Uh, introduction. Okay, so it's conjecture. So this is the twin prime conjecture. Uh, as I said before, that uh, pn plus one. So the gaps past any point you choose, uh, one of them will still be as small as two. So that's what the limit is doing. Uh, blah blah blah. Out of reach by present method. So uh, this is the work he was referencing before, and he has the weak conjecture that this is at least like less than infinity. Um, so well, he did prove this because it's less than seventy million. So this is what they were attempting, trying to do apparently. But they prove a weaker version where it's not the gaps, but like maybe the gaps like modulated by some like slowly growing function. Level of distribution, whatever this is. Uh, should probably look up what this is. Uh, for an arbitrarily small, this... What is this? Is this var epsilon? I don't know what this letter is. It's probably var pi something. But anyway, I just pretend this is an epsilon. This will be valid. Uh, okay, this will be valid. So they proved it conditionally on this. Okay, uh, I should look up what this is. So apparently, so what they're saying is that this result is known, it's one half, but this result was proven by these three people contingent on the fact that the distribution is equal to one half plus a small number. Uh, this is actually a false result, but it's very close to the truth, so there's some sense in which this result is kind of close to true. Uh, so that's what he's saying here. Within a hair's breadth, yeah, so that's what they were saying. Uh, it's blah blah blah, and this result gives that. So this is what I was referencing before. So it's not the gaps, but they did manage to bound the gaps by this is a very slowly growing function that's like root log and log log. So um, number of very close results. So in some sense, this paper was kind of how do I phrase this? So you know how Einstein would have discovered like Einstein discovered relativity, but if he wasn't there, um, like Poincaré was there and like Lorenz was there and he was building on their work. So someone 
would have found it. It was kind of the right time for that kind of thing. So I think in some sense, Yitang published this paper at the right time. Um, there was a lot of very close results and it was just about to be solved, I think. And of course he put like a lot of work into it and like he worked at Subway for like a number of years and just did this essentially in his free time. Uh, but it's not too surprising that a small extension of these results would give uh, the full result of like, bounded gaps. So one may ask whether methods in whatever this reference is combined with blah blah blah. Uh, some stronger versions of this theorem would be good enough for proving this. Okay, I should really look up what this theorem is. Actually, I'll just go and do that now. In case you're not already bored, uh, pretty much all of the videos in the series are going to be like this. So if you're still here, I presume you're actually gaining something from this. A major result, distribution, blah blah blah, uh, application, large sieve. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, um, look into this more later, but it just seems to be probably like in the next episode I'll explain what this is. Uh, just something bounding the distribution in some way. Uh, I should look up what the level of distribution is, I'll make a note of that. Okay, so uh, give affirmative answer to the above question. Yep, we adapt the following notation. So this is a set of distinct non negative integers. Um, so we say it's admissible if uh, this is the prime valuation uh, less than p, so blah blah. blah. Oh wait, no, this is not the valuation, this is just the, denotes the number of distinct residue classes module P occupied by the HI. So what does this mean, distinct residue Okay, so... Admissible if this is... Ah, okay, so I guess what they're saying is for every prime P, they want these integers to at, omit at least one of their residue classes mod P. Yeah, uh, it's less than P. Yeah, okay, so... Essentially, a uh, kind of negation of that is for every prime, there. Let's see. The, okay. Uh, there's no prime for which this kind of just spans every residue class. So you take this mod p, reduce it, you're going to have at most p entries, of course, but they want this to be less than for every prime p. I'm not sure what examples of this would be. Um, but we'll go ahead. Well, obviously, if like one is, yeah, fine. But probably uh, go through more about that later. We'll see exactly why they want this. Missable with, uh, this looks like where the 70 million came from. Um, this one with this, okay, k0. So they want at least this many numbers in this admissible set. Implementing policy for interest n, contains at least prime. Consequently, we have this. Okay, why does this imply that? It's infinitely many positive integers, such that the k tuple contains at least two primes. Okay, well, what happens if there's a positive integer such that this contains at least two primes? Well, if this one is a prime and like that one is a prime. K0 greater than this. Okay, presumably if these are two primes, then somehow like, these must be bounded by 7 times 10 to the 7, and that would give this result. Um, contains at least two primes. What I don't understand is, so you're bounding the number of these things, but why does this actually bound the difference between these two things? Those are distinct non-negative integers. Yeah, okay, I'm not quite sure about that. And results from, okay, well, they explain this here, from the fact that if H is admissible, if it is composed of this many distinct primes, Okay, yes, this makes sense. Uh, why does this make sense? Okay, so uh, H is admissible if this is less than, so for each of the actual primes within H, uh, if you look at this function, well, it's just gonna be, it's gonna be a zero, and then there's gonna be a bunch of other ones. Okay, greater than K0, yeah, so there's, if there's this many, numbers in H, and you pick any modulus greater than K0, there's clearly no way that you can like hit every residue class. Um, if you look at any prime less than K0, and uh, look at the valuation, or I don't know what they call this, like nu of P of H, um, why does this not hit every residue class? Uh, oh, because it can't hit the zero residue class, because these are primes, of course, and then if you pick a prime less, then like it won't divide any of these existing primes, so this is true. So. Um, yeah, so let me just make sure this is clear. If P is 
greater than or equal, no, so if p is greater than k0, there's no way just by counting that they can have every residue class, it's less than k0, then actually less than or equal to k0, if which is greater than k0, then it won't divide any of the primes, and so 0 will not be, yeah, so basically the residue class 0 will be omitted from h mod p. And so consequently, this is less than p. Okay, so this makes sense. And the inequality, this, okay. I guess this is just something you can verify, um, but why does this actually imply that? This looks like just some result that's true for small numbers. Uh, so maybe this is why the bound needs to be this big, is because uh, this is like the first-ish number for which this holds. Um, this is like times 20. I would expect it to be like times 2 or something, but I guess it's not. Okay, h is admissible if it is composed of this many distinct primes, so they're infinitely positive many inches, it just contains at least two primes. Still don't quite understand, oh by the way, pi here is the Prime, it's probably the prime counting function. I figured if it's inclusive or exclusive, it doesn't even matter for numbers this big. Then, why does this imply this? Okay, it contains at least two primes. K0 tuple. Okay, well, first, um, first, if this is admissible, oh, so, okay, so if h is admissible, then if you do this and you add any positive integer to h, it's still going to be admissible because all this does is just, like, shuffle all the residue classes around modulo any p. So, uh, h admissible implies that, like, h plus n, I don't know what notation it is, admissible. Oh, and I just realized that uh, you couldn't have, s you didn't see this, wonderful. Um, so, sort of k0, anyway, uh, I'm convinced of this, so if you have k distinct primes, uh, p is greater than k, there's no way you can have, just by counting argument, um, that like you hit every residue class modulo p, because there's just more than k0 of them, and if it's less, then you're going to omit the 0 one, because they're all primes, and you picked a prime smaller than k0, and all of these primes are bigger than k0, so you're going to omit the 0 residue class, so this makes sense, um, this part I understand. Anyway, back to this. So if you have uh, h, so h plus, so if you have this admissible set, so if h is admissible with this, then basically every one of these sets is going to be as miss, also admissible, which is okay. Uh, and then if this contains at least two primes, why does this? Ah, so I guess this is a special case. So h is admissible if it is composed of this. So suppose you choose this set of k zero distinct primes, each of which is greater than k naught. Um, and then you apply this theorem to that, admissible with k0. Um, so then this infinitely has many positive integers. Ah, so I see, this is why. So you take h to be k0 distinct primes, um, and you know that, th so uh, there's something, here's p1 all the way to p of k0. This one is greater than k0. And uh, what this statement here is saying is that this last prime is less than 70 million. Right, because, uh, yeah, so this makes sense. This is your k0. And uh, if the prime counting function at 70 million is minus the prime counting function here, so uh, let me draw it this way. Here's k0. Uh, this prime counting function here, pi of k0, counts how many primes are in this region. Uh, prime counting function at 70 million counts how many primes are in this region. So the difference of them is greater than k0. So there's at least k0 primes in between k0 and 70 million. So what you can do is you can take h to be equal to the set of, like, just pick any k0 of these primes within this region, and so all of them will be at least k0, uh, and then you have k0 of these, and this last one will be less than 70 million. Right. And so once you have this, you can apply the theorem 1 to this. So the infinite one, any blah, 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 blah. Anyway, you add 
and this will still be an admissible set, and this contains at least two primes. Well, actually, we don't even need that for this theorem. But so if you, yeah, so this is an admissible set with k not greater than whatever this is, and so blah 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 contains at least two primes. So basically, what you're saying is if you add any integer to all of these primes, eventually you're going to hit two primes, and then these two are necessarily going to be two primes that are at most. 70 million apart in gap because, uh, well, this minus that is at most 70 million, and so adding them doesn't change this gap. Um, so, yeah, this is clear why this now implies this result. And uh, this also gives some insight as to where the 70 million bound comes from. You pick your k naught to be this big, which I'm sure he'll go into reasons later why he needs. Uh, then you need this inequality. So, 70 million, I presume, is like the smallest round number that satisfies this inequality uh, because you need at least k naught primes bigger than k naught. So, uh, this pushes you up all the way to 70 million. And uh, once you have that set, uh, the bound is like bounded between like whatever k naught is and then 70 million. He just rounded it up to 70 million, and so that's the size of the gap that you just proved. And so it's quite should be quite easy to shrink this if you can shrink k naught, and then like just use this inequality to tell you like what bound you get from that. Okay, so that's clear. Um, that's first page done. So somewhere this is introduction up here. And then down here is the main result and explaining how they're going to go about it. Um, basically, it looks like the result, the main aim of this paper is, of course, to prove theorem 1, which then implies the result stated uh, at the front of the paper. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe this observation will come in later, where if you add anything to an admissible set, it'll still be admissible. Good to know. Okay, page 2. Uh, results not optimal, yeah, so this can also crude, and there are ways to relax it, and so. It's open problem, yeah, and it was like done by other people after this. Uh, notation, all of this looks fairly standard. Yeah, it's actually pretty like nice that he gave this here, so it's gonna be pretty useful. Uh, things to note, well, I'll probably just come back here if we see anything. Uh, this thing, just from a glance, this looks weird, this looks non standard. Uh, so blah 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 blah, characteristic function, blah blah blah. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll come back if I notice anything weird. Okay, top the costs. Okay, H is always assumed to be admissible and fixed. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming by fixed he just means that set of k naught primes that are all greater than k naught. Right. Okay. Right. This um, I don't. I'm just going to call this the valuation, even though it's not. Uh, this is just how many residue classes are hit by H mod P, and uh, if it's admissible, then by definition this has to be less than P. So you, you can never hit every residue class modulo P for an admissible set. Quantity. It's regarded as a constant, so the fact that they fixed it means that anything depends on H. Absolutely convergent product. Um, I don't know if I always keep figuring if this is an S or something, it doesn't matter. So the convergent product, blah blah blah, is a constant. Okay, uh, why is this a constant? PP of over P product of P. Uh, Oh, we write VP for V, okay, yeah, so this is fixed, this depends on H, but it's treated as a constant. Um, why is this absolutely convergent? Well, first of all, this never hits P, so uh, this thing is never zero, so it, the thing is about products, if it's zero, it diverges to zero, which is weird, but, uh, because you can take logs. So, uh, that's good, and then this is 1 minus P to the minus K0, what is K0? Oh yeah, K0 was the fixed thing before, um, and why is this absolutely convergent? Well, if you turn this into a sum, it's pretty much the sum of minus vp over p, uh, and like you ignore the one minus or whatever, and then uh, minus one over p, k naught over p. Kind of looks like that. And so why is this sum that makes sense? Uh, minus vp minus ah, so this is really k naught. Uh, no, 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 it's not. Oh, minus k naught. Ah, okay, then yeah, it is. it's k naught minus vp over p uh, summed. And so if this is sufficiently small, then I guess this does make sense. Um, still not quite sure why this, if I recall, the sum of the inverse primes actually does diverge. Um, I think there's some weird result, the sum of the print primes converges. Yeah, well, if it diverges, then like the job would be done, but so. I'll come back to this. It seems like a, just an example. Um, although maybe this is a sign of things to come that I don't actually have enough knowledge to understand, enough background to understand, but we'll, we'll see. That's blah, blah, blah. 
sufficiently small. Yeah, okay, epsilon is small and A is large. Okay. Means blah, 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 may vary from here. Okay. Uh, implied in this will depend on this at most. Okay, cool. Call underlying proof of, proof of 7 theorem 1. So, uh, evaluating this. Okay, sure. This sum, uh, this notation, if you recall, uh, was from where? It was from here. So it means that uh, small q is totally large q means that it's between like 1 and twice that. So what this expands to is x less than n less than 2x. Yeah, and uh, okay, actually, yeah, this is less than equal to. Yeah, okay, cool. Instead of evaluating these sums, um, so you're summing between this and then you compute this squared, whatever. Well, this is a real function depending on. Okay, any real function depending on whatever. And uh, this is another sum that just looks more complicated. Uh, this thing is still here, 1 to k0, where k0 was the thing before. Um, this is log n if n is prime. Isn't this von Mangold? I should look this up. Or maybe it's the von Mangold is like prime powers as well. I forget this. Anyway, it's good to look up. Yeah, okay, so this is just von Mangold except without prime powers. This is just like simply the prime characteristic function. I don't want to call it that. This is really log n times the characteristic function. Of the primes. Yeah, various von, von Mangold is the same thing but with prime powers. Uh, not the same thing, prime power because it's log p when p. Uh, yeah. Anyway, definitions here. Um, this looks. Yeah, this is understandable. Uh, each of these h i's is. I presume. Let me check. Yeah, this is just the individual components. So yeah, so this is just the sum of for h in. Uh, admissible set which is consumed to like a k naught primes bigger than k naught uh, of this theta function n plus um, h yeah and uh, this n plus h actually so uh, you could equally well phrase this h plus n and we know that h plus n is invisible whenever h is invisible so maybe this will come in later um, and then you have the squared thing whatever this is point is to prove I should probably actually read this paper but I might do that later what is the proof with an appropriate choice of... Okay, so you choose this very trickily to make things work. Uh, that this is greater than zero. So why is this implies that there's an n, uh, such that there's an x less than or equal to n, less than... Yeah, x less than or equal to n, less than 2x. For sufficiently large x, that there is an n bounded in some way by x, such that the tuple 1.4 contains at least two primes. And 1.4 was the... Uh, thing they mentioned in theorem one here, yeah. So uh, basically, this is how you prove this result: is you prove this, and this will imply such that there, blah blah blah, such that the tuple contains at least two primes. Yeah, and uh, by tuple in one point four, they mean like the uh, set, like the admissible set H plus N. So uh, this is the conclusion of the theorem one that was on the first page. Or, sorry, first page, second page, first page. Uh, can see at least two primes, so this is what they want. Uh, why does this imply that? Uh, let's see. So what is, so this is theta. So um, basically this is going to be zero. If, so basically this is sum over, yeah, so you can rephrase this inner sum as uh, this thing, uh, sum over h in h plus n of theta. Uh, but actually this is only the sum of h in h plus n prime, because of course theta is zero when it's not prime. Uh, I'll just use this for primes. Um, and this is actually, this reduces the log n when n is prime, so you can equally well write it as this. And uh, let's see, yeah, so you sum this. Okay, cool. And uh, S1 is just the sum of n similar to x of lambda of n squared. And S2 is the same thing, except lambda of n squared is multiplied by this factor, which may or may not be zero, depending on how many primes are there. Um, okay, so why does it imply that there's one of these S2 minus log of 3x S plus 1? So, let's see. S2, uh, log of 3x S plus 1. Okay, so what they seems like they're trying to do is S1, S1 is going to be smaller I presume although like sometimes you'll have no primes in which case you multiply it by zero so uh, basically if this is 
bigger than S1. That means there's plenty of these things. Um, and so I presume this log of 3 of x is six, log of 3x is strong enough so that this has to have at least two terms. Uh, what happens if we assume that this only has one term? So basically each one of these, uh, let me write this out on a different piece of paper actually. Uh, yeah, so suppose that this is not true. So it's that for every n, n like roughly x such that tuple, uh, so the, for every n such like enough, f for every n that is roughly on the order of x in this precise manner, uh, h plus n contains at most one prime. Then s2 um, is at most sum of n similar to x of uh, this lambda of n squared times, so let's see, sum. Okay, so this is at most, like at most one term in the sum is actually contributing. Um, and it's at most like log of what? Log of k naught or log of in h plus n. So it's log of n plus whatever the biggest prime in h is. Um, which they, I guess they call h of k naught and not p of k naught. But anyway, so this is, if this conclusion is false, which it's not, so presumably you're going to get a contradiction at some point. Okay, this is true. And uh, we know that s2, well, we want to prove that s2 is bigger than log of 3x times s1, where s1 is just the same thing, except uh, this is always 1. Yeah, okay, so what's the contradiction here? Uh, and this is log of n. So basically n is similar to x, so that means that n is at most 2x. And then h of k naught is what? Um, for sufficiently large x. So it's... Okay, so yeah, if this is sufficiently large x, then this is basically negligible compared to x. So this is like going to be 2x plus uh, x times 2 plus epsilon, essentially, for sufficiently large x. And so uh, then you can just factor this out, and so you get that S1, um, S2, sorry, S2 is equal to log of 2 plus epsilon x times S1. Right. And but they prove that S2 is bigger than log of 3x times S1. So here's the contradiction, right? So if you uh, assume that this stuff, uh, that there is an n sim, so there's, so we phrase this this way. If you assume that there is no n. Uh, of size x, even for sufficiently large x, that has at least two primes within the like uh, h plus n set, uh, this like shifted admissible set, which is itself still admissible, then uh, you can bound this sum by what n plus the largest prime in h, or the largest entry of h, I don't think they actually need it to be prime, yeah, the largest entry of h, uh, n is bounded by 2x because um, you assume n similar to x, and uh, this h is essentially epsilon for epsilon times x for x large enough because this is a fixed number. And so you get this 2 plus epsilon, whereas here you have a 3x. So here you have 2 epsilon x. And so this is smaller, but if you assume this, then this is true. And so this eventually, for a sufficiently large x, will like kill this bound, uh, will contradict this bound. So that's where it comes from. So yeah, so if you can prove this, then I agree. Um, there's an epsilon. So this applies implies theorem 1. Um, but you need to have like a sufficiently nice choice of lambda. And uh, yeah, some of the cases with lambda zero, but I'm not gonna worry about that. Okay, so this is our new goal. Uh, this implies theorem one, which implies the main result. Okay, so uh, in seven, the function this mainly takes this form. Okay, this is some crazy form. I'll make sure I actually understand each part of this. Okay, this is k naught. This is the k naught from before, the size of h, uh, whatever the heck this l naught is. Uh, is this in the list of notation? I will see soon. It is not, actually. I should figure out what this L0 is. Uh, that's just factorial, 1 over the d dividing p of n. What the hell is p of n? Uh, I don't know either. Okay, but d is less than. Okay, well, d is a power. Okay, they say where. Um, I should really look at what this is. Okay, yeah, so this is a p of n. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Where d is a power of x. Okay, sure. Um, so this is little d dividing this monster, uh, little d less than, so this is like bounded divisors, okay. Uh, this is the Mobius function, um, which for those of you who don't know, I guess you can look it up, but uh, if I remember correctly, it's like one sometimes and zero sometimes, and this is one if it has an even number of prime factors. Like, actually, I forget. I should really know this thing, but I don't. 
Yeah, okay. So it's zero if it uh, has any repeated prime factor. It's one if it has, so basically, um, it counts the parity of the number of prime factors, assuming there's no repeated one. So zero if it has any square divisor besides one. So uh, repeated prime factors, uh, one if it's an even number, and they're all distinct, and negative one, so it's, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, that's the Mobius function. Uh, this looks like some sort of Mobius inversion thingy. Uh, what the hell? L naught is, I don't know. Um, K naught plus L naught, log of this. This is a uh, D is the power of x. Is x an integer? Or I guess this is an uh, Yeah, well, it has to be if it's power of x. So I guess x is an integer, which I haven't been assuming actually so far. Uh, P of n, what is this? So this is the product of everything in this shifted invisible set. Uh, and then just like take the product of this, which is. Notation that's probably people will yell at me for, but uh, yeah, good enough. Uh, this is a big product. D dividing this big product, so D divides presumably some like combination of these factors, and it's like sufficiently small. Uh, log base D over D. Um, okay, well, this is always going to be positive, because this is always going to be bigger than 1, and you raise it to this power. I mean, it takes the form L not bigger than 0. Um, I, I'm guessing for now that's an integer. Well, you have to take a factorial, so it wouldn't make too much sense otherwise. Okay, sure, I'll just accept this and see what goes on. Uh, okay, cool. That this delta function, um, big delta function, uh, and blah blah blah, minus, uh, this is the Euler's Torsion function, which counts the number of co-prime things less than or equal to d, 2d. Uh, this is, again, summing over only things that are co-prime to d, so this is the greatest common divisor. And similar to x, okay, uh, what is this gamma? Uh, n congruent to c of d, or is this a product? So what is c for? Oh, n is congruent to c mod d, I think is what they mean by these parentheses. Okay, so these are both natural numbers um, for d co-prime to c. Okay, and then this gamma is something, I presume. Uh, well, it's a parameter, so I guess this is just, uh, this is just an arithmetic function. Um, you sum it over n, like roughly in the range of x, so again, that's uh, like greater than or equal to x, less than 2x. Congruent to c mod d. Okay, so yeah, some sort of restricted sum here of this arithmetic function, and then some sort of restricted sum here. And okay, this is just kind of an averaging over the co-prime, so uh, this is like the size of this set here, roughly. Except you're also doing it like similar to x, so it's some kind of weird restricted sum. In the case, if this wasn't here, then this would just be an average. Um, but now it's not, so I'll come back to this. And uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, he's just defining these. Uh, C is, okay, C between 1 and D, co-prime to D. Um, so there's going to be like totient of D of these. Uh, if it wasn't for this restriction at p of this p of c minus h sub i good to 0 mod d. Okay, well this is weird. So d again, I'm presuming d is the same thing as here, so d is going to be a divisor of this. Uh, if this is congruent to 0 mod d, then c sub i I'm not quite sure what this means. I'll come back to it if I need to. Anyway, you evaluate this and this. Uh, I presume with like all these complicated definitions, you just plug it into this stuff up here, and then you just trudge through the algebra, and uh, you compute this left-hand side is equal to this right-hand side, where stuff is defined. Uh, what is the stuff? For d at most this. Okay, d is a power of x, remember. Uh, for d less than x. Isn't this kind of a contradiction? Wait, they say here where d is a power of x. And they say here for d less than x to the one half minus epsilon. It's a bit troubling, okay. T1 and T2 star certain arithmetic sum, C lemma 1 below, okay, we will see that. And uh, this curly E is, do I understand every individual term in here? Uh, this is Mobius, 
Uh, these are, okay, that makes sense. This is just a sum. Uh, this is in the set that was defined before, co prime stuff to D with some restriction on P uh, of this big delta function, which again was defined here. And so seems here that this delta, so this is arithmetic and this is DNC. Actually, I wonder if there's a way to simplify this. Uh, yeah, so delta of theta, so make all in D comma C is just going to be what? Well, it's the sum of n similar to x, or roughly x, uh, where n is congruent to c mod d. And again, this is the sum over c co-prime, so this is already co-prime, and then blah blah blah, and this is less than, yeah, so that makes sense, of what? So of theta of n, this is only over n prime, uh, only the prime ones contribute, and so these like these are like primes modulo d equal to something, which is interesting already. Uh, and this is phi of d. This is the totient function. Sum of n similar to x uh, co prime. C isn't c already co prime? No, no. This is sum over n co prime. Okay. This implies n co prime to d as well, right? Yeah, because c is co-prime to d, and so if it's good, yeah, then it's co-prime. Yeah, so all of this is actually some n similar to x, uh, yeah, of n co-prime to d, of what, theta of n, except here, it's also the restriction, I'm running out of space here, but this is an Iverson bracket of n congruent to c mod d, minus 1 over totient of what is this just theta okay so if you go back to here yeah you can just rewrite this as sum over n similar to x uh, equal to 1 so some n similar to x co prime to d uh, just theta of n times iris in bracket of n congruent to c mod d uh, minus 1 over torsion. I don't know if this is useful, but I guess this gives me an understanding of like how this kind of function behaves. At least I'll remember it slightly better. Uh, one of these tiles. For some reason, this definition list of stuff. Yeah, okay, here we go. Yeah, tau is the divisor function. Uh, tau 2 is just tau. Uh, tau j is the divisor function. Um, some of this j is like the exponent. Tau 3 and tau k minus 1. Uh, I should look this up actually. I forget if this is like the sum of the divisors with powers. Yeah, oh, usually it's sigma, that's why. Yeah, okay, so that makes sense. So basically, tau j is equal to the sum of d dividing q of uh, d to the power of j, uh, where j is the subscript. Okay, so I understand each individual part of this. I have no idea why this is relevant, but we'll keep going. Uh, let whatever this is be a small constant. I'd, actually, I should look up what the name of this letter is at some point. Uh, if d is this, okay, and then blah, blah, blah. Okay, prove that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm still a bit confused because they originally said like d is a power of x, and here they're saying that d is like smaller than x. Um, which, oh yeah, I'll just go on, but it's a bit weird. If d is slightly bigger than the fourth root, and uh, k naught is sufficiently large in terms of this. Um, k naught sufficiently large in terms of small constant. I mean, I guess it just means big. Presumably like 3.5 times 10 to the 6 is big. Uh, prove I'll have a sufficient choice of L naught. So, okay, here's what they're choosing L naught. Back this, I was slightly confused about that. Uh, back on the previous page, which I left somewhere. Yeah, where I left here. Uh, they said L not greater than zero, but here's where they actually like use that freedom. Uh, one can prove that this stuff is bigger than something else. Uh, this is exactly the term that appears here. Um, if you compute this thing, which you want to prove is bigger than zero, um, then here's one term you have to compute. Here's the other terms you have to compute, um, and you say that this. So presumably, here's like big O notation, right? So if you can prove that this is like massively hugely growing or dominating these, then eventually this will be positive for sufficiently large x. And you get this result, and then you like prove boundary gaps. So 
you want to prove that this is fairly fast going, or at least faster. Uh, this is fairly fast going, faster than like all of this OF stuff. And so you can prove that it's fast going. Uh, wait, so this is an X actually. So basically, you want to prove that this is, in some sense, like much faster going than X to the power of like L k naught plus two L naught. So you want to prove essentially that this term is like asymptotically way faster than that. And you can actually prove that. So uh, here you have L to the k naught plus two L naught plus one, which is sufficient. Uh, and so, and so there you go. And uh, assuming this can be bounded, which I think they talk about actually right here, the error epsilon can be bounded. Oh, okay, so that's where the error came from. Um, so I guess we don't actually have to care too much about this error term besides showing it's like smallish, uh, smallish being defined by that. Actually, by that, but uh, close enough. Primes have level distribution. This, okay, so this is what they were talking about before. So this is a previous result that they've already shown. Uh, but they assume something like incorrect, which, yeah, so um, they prove that if the primes have level of distribution this for an arbitrarily small this, then you get that, except it's actually one half, so this is not good. Uh, but if you do assume this, then you can bound this error epsilon. Uh, this error epsilon given by this, uh, and it's what we like don't, it's what we want to throw away here, because uh, you want to show that this is positive. And so if this is like too negative, then uh, even if the first term here, dominates the second term, and I'm like writing way too much stuff, then this could like kind of ruin your day. So you want to show that this is small, um, and then once you show that this result holds, where the first term, well the coefficient of the first term grows larger than uh, this power, which is bigger than that, so good enough, uh, bigger than that, then you're kind of home free. So this is small enough if that, but this is not good. Uh, one is able to prove by present methods. Yep. On the hand for d, uh, so if d is slightly bigger than x to the 1 fourth, then this is true. Um, if d is slightly smaller than x to the 1 fourth, then uh, this theorem, which shows that uh, this distribution level, uh, or whatever, should really figure out what the level distribution is, uh, but this theorem where it shows it's equal to 1 half, it's good enough for bounding epsilon, but then 2.6 can't be valid. So even a more general form of whatever is considered and uh, there's a reference. So this is actually kind of interesting what he's saying here. So. Let's see. What he's saying is, if you choose d larger, yeah, if you choose d larger than x to the one fourth, then you can get a really good bound on this linear term in front, uh, this term that you want to show is big. You can show it's big, uh, but you can only show the error is small, assuming things that aren't true. And if you assume stuff that is true, the Bombieri Vinogradov theorem or whatever, um, then if d is slightly smaller than x to the one fourth, then you actually can bound the error fine, uh, using things that are true, but then you can't actually show that the linear term is big. So it's kind of, yeah, you, you, you either get one result or the other, but you can't get both, and that's kind of like annoying, even if more, yeah, so basically, assuming stuff that isn't true, you can uh, bound the, so, okay, assuming d is like slightly bigger than that, you get the result you want for how fast the thing grows, but you can only bound the error assuming false things. Uh, but if you assume it's smaller, then you can bound the error, but you can't prove that the thing grows. So, yeah, that's kind of the issue here. The crux here is to, of course, to, uh, let me put this, up. yeah, so the crux here is to show that this is positive, and so you need this thing to grow sufficiently fast, faster than the second term, and you need this error to be sufficiently small, smaller than uh, roughly the second term. Um, so you can either get one or the other using code methods, and I presume his main insight is somehow a way to get both of these. Okay. Uh, Actually, I think that's probably a good time to wrap up today. It's already been like, what, 40 minutes? So yeah, that's where we ended up today. Uh, just a quick recap of everything. So we start uh, twin prime conjecture. This is like the holy grail, what we want. Uh, people have been working towards proving this stuff uh, that basically like the limit is not two, but it's like a finite number, right? Eventually a finite number. Uh, but they've only been able to prove this assuming stuff that's false according to the Vinograd God of theorem, um, there's some prior work on this, uh, but here he outlines his main approach, where he talks about admissible sets, and he wants to prove that if you choose an admissible set, so uh, he's in particular going to apply it to an admissible set of a bunch of primes that is sufficiently large, that's where the 70 million comes from, uh, but if you have an admissible set and you just keep adding, like you just shift it by one, uh, eventually you're going to hit one that has two primes, and actually this is going to happen infinitely often, and this is enough to give you 
the result if you start with the uh, admissible set containing k non distinct primes. Okay, so this is a new target to prove the bounded gaps. And of course, to prove this, um, the second page is just notation. Uh, the main outline is uh, given apparently in this reference where he defines these two functions. And then uh, if you can prove that S2 is greater than like log 3x of S1, then uh, this is essentially incompatible with uh, the shifted divisible sets eventually not containing f primes, um, uh, which, which I showed on the piece of scratch paper. Uh, basically, you end up with this contradiction, right? So uh, now this becomes a new target. This implies the theorem one that we want, which then implies the boundary graphs choosing the admissible set correctly. Okay, and so uh, to prove this, uh, the previous paper, the previous work, what they did was they defined, uh, chose a specific function. You have a lot of freedom in choosing this function, actually and then define a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and then eventually you get the result you want, uh, which is that this is equal to that, and you want to show that this right-hand side is positive uh, to be able to prove this result, which proves theorem one, which proves primes. So um, you want to show that this stuff is positive, and I've kind of scribbled all over it, but there's first term here, which is linear, uh, so the sum coefficient, and then x, and this is plus O of x times L to the k naught plus two L naught, and then plus an error term. And uh, so you want to prove that this coefficient is larger than that, uh, while simultaneously proving that the error term is smaller than that. So uh, these two terms will eventually become negligible, and so this grows, and then this grows far enough, you get this side to be positive, and that proves the result. Uh, so you want this big and that small. Um, and then the main issue here is with the previous work, they, uh, based on judicious choices of whatever this d parameter is, uh, they could prove either that the coefficient was big, um, or that the error was small. Uh, but they can't prove both. They can prove the error is small if, in the first case, but they have to assume that that's not true. Um, so I haven't read the rest of the papers, but it seems like uh, if they're going to extend this approach, then the main thing is either to find a way to prove the error is small here. Um, actually, I think that's probably the only way. So you need to figure out some way to figure out, to prove that this error is small um, without assuming this false assumption on the distribution of primes, uh, because if you choose d, yeah. So if you choose d slightly larger than x to one fourth, then you get the immediate result you want about the coefficient. But then your error can't really be bounded well uh, without additional assumptions. But it looks like this could be done. It's not a priori false. So perhaps this is what he's doing. Uh, it seems like in the second case, actually, there's kind of no hope because uh, you can't prove this relation at all, uh, even for a more general form of lambda. Then there's still a little bit of room in this regard, like you don't have to prove it's bigger than k naught plus two naught plus one, you could prove like plus a half, you could have some weird screwed thing where it's like still technically larger than L plus this, but I don't, it, this seems harder. So I'd be surprised if the paper went this route of assuming this theorem that gives you like a bound on the error, but like somehow proves like a slightly less strong uh, growth bound on this. I think what he's gonna do is this, although I can't, I haven't read the paper obviously, we're gonna find out soon I guess. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at today. Uh, next time we'll leave off roughly here, now that we have a good idea of kind of the main outline, the main attack uh, of this approach. Um, so if what I said is correct, that he's going to go this approach, uh, this part is taken care of by previous work and he's mostly going to try to bound this error without assuming like nonsense. Um, so yeah, we'll see whether that is true. Uh, he could also attack this trip, but yeah. See how it goes next time. Um, yeah, I hope you found something useful with this. Uh, if you're still watching at all, I fully expect like zero people to make it this far in the view. Um, yeah, thanks for watching.